We are, we are in week eight of our series, Loving Like Jesus, and we've been talking about how Jesus loved people, okay? He, was, he showed them merciful love and peaceful love and healing love and forgiving love. He loved them unconditionally. And today we're going to be talking about this idea of joyful love, of how when we love people, it should bring us joy. Here's the thing that we need to understand, okay? What we celebrate tells a lot about who we are. But it doesn't just tell a lot about who we are, it tells a lot about how we really are down deep inside, okay? If we celebrate weddings, it reveals your love of love, okay? If you celebrate a touchdown, it reveals your love of football, and it also reveals the fact that you are possibly not a Bears fan, okay? Mm hmm. Yeah, it's just true. If you celebrate birth, it reveals your love of life. If you celebrate an anniversary, it reveals your love of your marriage. If you celebrate an election, it reveals your love of politics and the fact that you may need to seek medical help. That's something to celebrate. <laughs> If you celebrate an A on your child's test, it, it, so it reveals your love of learning. And if you celebrate National Pigs in a Blanket Day, it reveals the fact that you may need to get out a little bit more, okay? What we celebrate says a lot about us. And what we celebrate can also determine if we truly have joy in our lives or something else. Today I want to take a minute to talk about something that is really not politically correct, okay? When Jesus taught throughout Scripture, he often talked about reaching lost people. And this is not supposed to be a slight on anyone, but it has been taken that way for a while. When, when, we, when we say the word lost, it brings this negative connotation with it. And it's not supposed to. That's not what this is about, okay? When something is lost, it simply means that it is not where it is supposed to be, right? So let me ask you a question. Has anybody ever lost their keys in the room? If you lose your keys, it simply means your keys are not where they are supposed to be, but they are where you left them, right? Remember the old mom? I can't find my keys. Where'd you leave them? If I knew where I left them, they wouldn't be lost, right? Here's the thing. When people are lost, it simply means one thing. It's saying that they are not where they're supposed to be. And that is in relationship with Christ. That's all it means. It's not meant to be negative. It's not meant to be hurtful. It's not meant to be any of those things. It simply means that someone that is lost doesn't know that they are meant to be in relationship with a loving God. And the truth be told, there are many people in America today who don't know they're lost. But know this. In the next 24 hours, several thousand people will die without a relationship with Christ and will spend eternity separated from Him. And that should break our hearts. And that's why Jesus told these three stories we're going to be looking at in Luke chapter 15. So I want to encourage you to open up to Luke chapter 15 in your Bibles. If you have the YouVersion app on your phone, you can search for the live event. Um, all of the notes will be right there. Or you can also um, be checking out the screens if you don't have any of those things. All right, those are all available for you. So we're not going to go back and, and look at all three of those, these stories really in depth. But I want to take a minute and I want us to notice something in these stories, okay? So we're going to pick up... Um, in verse 15, or in chapter 15, verse 5, and it says this. It's talking about a man who lost a sheep. And when he finds it, what happens when he finds them? So Luke 15, 5 says this. And when he has found it, his sheep, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I found my lost sheep. I found something that was lost. And you know what he's really saying? It's time to throw a party. Because what was lost has now been found. This man celebrates that his sheep was found. But I want you to understand something, okay? Jesus doesn't just tell these stories for no good reason. See, in this story, the shepherd, it's not really a shepherd. It's meant to be Jesus. 
And in this story, the sheep is not really a sheep. It's meant to represent you and I before we find Christ. And listen to, to the result. When something that is lost is found, listen to the result in verse 7. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. So what happens in heaven when a lost person is found? Anybody got any ideas? There's a party. There is rejoicing. Why? Because something that was lost has been found. When we look at the next story. It's a story about a woman who lost a coin and what happens when she finds it. And so in Luke 15, starting in verse 9, it says this, And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. What does she do when she finds her lost coin? Anybody got any ideas? She throws a party. She rejoices. She takes the coin that she just found and she goes and buys a big old cake and they have a party because what was lost has now been found. It's important to celebrate. But I want you to understand something. This woman in the story, it's not really meant to be your own woman. It's a representation of Jesus. And the coin, the coin is meant to be us. And Jesus simply wants us back where we belonged from the beginning in relationship with him. And here's the truth. The truth is this. Sometimes I think we celebrate the wrong things. We celebrate the wrong things. Especially in church, sometimes we celebrate the wrong things. I think sometimes we question whether it's appropriate to celebrate inside the church walls or not. That's why when I tell you that I want you to get your blower out and blow it, everybody's like, we sure that's okay Blow a blower in church. And, and if you think a blower's crazy, you just need to wait till we get to the end. <laughs> I just want to tell you something. I'm here to tell you with all the, everything I have in me, yes, it is appropriate to celebrate in church. And, and here's something else I want to say. This is not the church. You are the church. And we've been called to celebrate because of what God has done for the church. God didn't die on a cross for a building made of bricks. God died on a cross for a people that he calls his very own. Remember that. And just so we're clear, I'm going to get a little fired up today, and I hope that's okay with you. But here's the thing. We have to be careful that we don't celebrate the wrong things. Oftentimes, we celebrate things like, well, like attendance in church. All right? Sometimes we celebrate attendance. And it's not always a bad thing, but, but here's the problem. If we're using our attendance as a litmus test as to whether or not we are successful, then we're missing the point. But if we're celebrating our attendance because more people are hearing the gospel and the waters of the baptistry are being stirred, then by golly, let's celebrate because that's worth celebrating. I'm going to ask you a question this morning, and this may be a really tough one for you to answer because sometimes it is for me too. But I want to ask you this. Do we cheerlead God to the world? What do you mean by that, Derek? Do we tell the world about all the good things that God has done for us? Or do we sit silent? I mean, here's the thing. Do we cheerlead God to the world as much as we cheerlead our kids to the world? Do we cheerlead God to the world as much as we cheerlead our favorite team? Or about our new car? Or this new job? Or my new house? Do we spend as much time telling the world how awesome God is as much as we spend time talking about the stuff that we have? Which, by the way, all the stuff that we have has been given to us by Him. Today I want us to take a minute and see what Jesus told us to celebrate and what kind of people we should really be when it comes to our celebration. So we're going to look at this story today. And you've probably heard it called the prodigal son. But I'm here to tell you that story is not about the son. That story is about a loving father who pursued his son. And you know who that loving father is? I think you'll find out by the end. So we're going to look at the story. But I want us to look at it from a little bit different perspective, okay? 
There are three types of people represented in this story, and we are all one of these three people in our lives, all right? So you, you with me? There's three people. You are one of the three. Sometimes you could switch back and forth, but most often you are one of the three of these, okay? So we're going to start in Luke 15, starting in verse 11, and this is what it says. And he said, Jesus said, there was a man who had two sons, and the younger one of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the young son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country, and there he squandered his property in reckless living. We've heard this story. This, this youngest son comes to his dad and he says, Hey, listen, dad, I wish you were dead. And that's what he says, right? I mean, in essence, he says, I wish you were dead. I want my inheritance now. You don't get your inheritance typically while the people are still alive. You get it when they are what? Dead. So he basically says to his dad, I wish you were dead. Give me my money. I want to take my inheritance now so I can go live life how I want to and not how you think I should. So the father, because he loves his son, does just that. He gives him what will be his, and the son goes and he squanders it away on wild living. This son is the first type of person we can be. And you know what kind of person that is? It is the joy faker. It's the joy faker. Let me explain. This son thought he could go out and act a way that his father never taught him to act, and he thought that that would bring him joy. He's a joy faker. But true joy is not found in your circumstances. It's not found in how you live your life. A joy faker can only see what is right in front of them. Write this down. A joy faker believes joy is only found in their experiences. That's a joy faker. They're faking it. It's not the real deal. Have you been around someone who allows their circumstances to dictate their mood and their attitude? Have you ever been around somebody like that? Something bad goes happen and it ruins their life for about 20 minutes or maybe a little longer, and then something else happens and they're happy, and you start to ask yourself a question, are they crazy? Because they're allowing their circumstances to dictate how they feel. Joy is not determined by our emotions. I'm going to say it again. Joy is not determined by our emotions. Do you know why? Because your emotions are liars. Your emotions lie to you. Your emotions tell you that you're angry or that you're sad or that you're happy or that you're this or that you're that. And the truth is, is your emotions lie. They lie a lot. You ever had the emotion that you feel like you hate somebody? Now, I'm not telling you to raise your hand. But 10 minutes later, you've already forgotten why you feel that way? That's because your emotions are lying to you. And you know who's the master of bringing out emotions in you? This is the enemy. Satan brings emotions. Why? Because he is the liar. See, there, there are a lot of people in the world that are joy fakers. Are you one? Maybe that's a hard answer. So we're going to move on. And then, then the son decides he's going to come home. And the father welcomes him home with loving arms. But the older brother is not happy. So we picked this up in Luke 15. It says this. Now his older son was in the field. And as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. So the son comes up thinking, hey, there's a party. Sounds like fun. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother's come and your father's killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and he refused to go in. 
His father came out and entreated him. But he answered his father, Look, these many years I've served you and I never disobeyed your command. You never, yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with your friends. But when the son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. The second son is the second type of person. It is the joy taker. The joy taker. If he wasn't going to get what he wanted, then he, wasn't, he was going to destroy the party for everybody else. He wasn't going to be joyful. He wasn't going to be happy because his son, his brother that had left and gone and squandered, gone and lived this life, gone and slept with prostitutes and basically went to Vegas and lived it up for a few weeks and then realized this was the stupidest decision I ever made. He wasn't happy that his brother that was as good as dead was back. He was mad because dad didn't throw a party for him. So he was not, by any stretch of the imagination, going to allow anybody else to find joy that his brother came home. He was going to take the joy out of it. He was going to take away everyone else's joy because of his selfish attitude. It was all about him. See, a joy taker is only concerned about themselves and their own happiness. And if they aren't happy, then no one else should be either. Anybody know a joy taker? Don't raise your hand. People in your life that you love, but you don't ever invite them to your parties because you know they'll suck all the fun out of the room. You know anybody like that? These people are joy takers. They can't imagine a world where anyone can find joy apart from them. Joy takers are selfish. And the truth is, is we have the power with our lives to give life or to take it, to give joy or to take it. So the question today is this, are you a joy taker? But then we get to the last person in this story, the, the father. He would do anything for his children to find true joy. And listen to what happens when the son who left came home. This is how he responds in Luke 15. He says, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him. And put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. And bring the fattened calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate. For this son, for this my son was dead and he is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to celebrate. But not only did he want that younger son to find true joy, he also wanted his older son to find true joy. And listen to what he says to his older son after his older son throws a little hissy temper tantrum, stomping his feet saying, well, you didn't throw a party for me. This is what his dad says. And he said to him, son, you're always with me and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad for this. Your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. See, this dad understood the real meaning of joy. The father, he is the third type of, portion, of person. He is the joy maker. And do you know who? Do you know who the father represents? Anybody. God himself. Because God is the true joy maker. His father wanted to do anything within his power to bring about a lifestyle of joy and contentment for his children. Now there's another little lesson to learn in here and it is this, parents, you don't always got to give your kids what they ask for because sometimes you need to tell them no. Because sometimes they need to learn to be content with what they have. See, he, this father, he wanted his children to experience true joy. This is the type of joy that is not determined by our circumstances or our emotions. This joy is only found in a loving relationship with our Father. See, joy makers lead people to find their contentment and purpose in the life they've been given, which is not determined by outside forces. Your joy is not determined by what's going on in your life. It shouldn't be. And if it is, that really means that you don't have joy. Because joy is always present. I've told you this before and I'm going to keep telling you this because it's something that I, I struggle with this because I'm just that type of person. And so up on my wall, if you walk in my office, I've got one of my diplomas hanging up on the wall and hanging on the edge of that diploma 
is a Christmas ornament. And you know what that Christmas ornament says? Joy. Do you know why? Because it is a constant reminder to me that my circumstances don't matter in view of what God did for me. I should have joy. Have you ever been around someone who brings life to everything they are a part of? You ever been around somebody like that? I think of a couple ladies that have gone to be with the Lord now, but one of them, her name was Juanita Ramsey. She, I'm sorry I may get choked up, she brought joy to everything. Everything. She brought joy. I wanted to be around her. There was days that I would go and sit at her house and just have conversations with her because she brought joy. She just had this overwhelming, overflowing joy that bubbled up out of her. And if any of you knew her, you know that about her. Another lady that I knew, her name was Connie Garten. And Connie had a debilitating disease. It was MS, right? She had MS. But she never complained. Never heard her complain. And she only talked about how good God was. She was a joy maker. And I wanted to be around her. See, these are the first people on the invite list when you're going to have a party. They bring joy. They bring life and love to every room and every circumstance they are in. These are the people you want around if there's bad news or if life throws you a curveball. Why? Because their perspective always wins the day. Because they've got the right perspective. See, the question is this. Are you a joy maker? Do you allow joy to overflow from your life? That people want to be around you because no matter the circumstance, they know that you got the right answer because you are getting your answers from him and not from yourself. And the other thing is this, is joy makers see the value in celebration. Joy makers are the first ones to show up at the party and the last one to leave. Why? Because they value celebration. They understand that when we take time to celebrate, it brings joy and it allows us opportunity to see what life is really about. And when we live in joy, we can love people the way that Jesus did. That's what being a joy maker is about. I want us to go back just for a minute, and I want to to explain this to you. See, the youngest son, he was trying to find joy by leaving his father. He thought that was the only way he could truly find joy. And he soon realized this, that true joy was actually found in the presence of the father, not separated from him. You guys know anybody in your life that might say something like this? Why? Well, I, I don't really want to get to know Jesus yet. I don't want to yield my life to him because I'm having too much fun. Know anybody like that? Or I don't want to miss something that I would miss if I was in relationship with him. See, that that is a person that is allowing their circumstances to dictate what their life is like. Those are not people that really have found joy. And I'm here to tell you today that the longer we try to seek to make ourselves happy in moments, the more unhappy we become because we start to realize that happiness is fleeting, but joy is eternal. See, the father knew something the son didn't. He knew that joyful love is a lifestyle. So let me ask you a question. Are we willing to celebrate? If the lost come home, are we willing to celebrate with joy? When we're transformed by the perfect love of Jesus, we should be the first to throw a party. Because we have something to celebrate that no one else does. Let me ask you a question this morning. Do we believe it is fitting to celebrate? What do you think? That's a pretty weak answer. Just saying. I want us to look back one more time at at verse 32. Listen to what it says. 
It was filling to fitting to celebrate, celebrate and be glad. For this, your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. See, this word fitting, well, it probably doesn't mean what you think it means. I think of the word fitting and I think about, well, that's probably a good idea. We could probably do that within that moment. This word fitting doesn't mean that. This word fitting, if you go back to the original language, the word fitting actually means you must. You must celebrate. It's not really a question. It's more of a, when's it going to happen? It is fitting to celebrate when someone who is lost is found. We must celebrate. See, and the truth is this, there is no other response to the dead coming to life but celebration. Amen? Here's the bottom line. We must decide if we will be a joy faker, taker, or maker. And when we choose right, celebration is our natural response. We should celebrate. The truth is this, joy should be our calling card. We should be full of joy. And if you're struggling to find joy apart from God, then that is a simple way of saying one thing to you. Are you ready to hear it? Come home where you belong. Don't be lost anymore. You don't have to be lost anymore. See, the truth is, is I think that we should probably have a few more party hats in the church. That's what I think. Anybody else think maybe we should have a few more party hats in the church? I think we should. I think that when we have people come home, we should celebrate. Because that's what God wants us to do. I think that we should find the joy that you're longing for. But we should do it together. Yeah, if somebody wants to get a picture, I'm sure you've already got one. He got one, yeah. Yeah, he loves to put pictures like this of me up on the internet. It's great. So here's the thing, church. We need to start celebrating. Amen? Bruce Larson is a pastor, and he was at a Presbyterian church in Omaha. And I don't know if you know much about the Presbyterian church, but they're not really known for getting very excited about what happens in their churches. So in this meeting, Bruce decided that these people, he was going to give them helium balloons. And he told them to release them at some point in the service when they felt like expressing the joy that was in their hearts. Since they were Presbyterians, they weren't really allowed to say things like praise the Lord or hallelujah or glory to God or anything like that. And so all throughout the service, these balloons started to ascend and hit the ceiling in the cathedral. Here's the problem. The problem was when this, when this was done, there were still a third of the balloons that were in the hands of the people in the audience. Can I just say something today? Church, it's time to release some balloons. It's time to celebrate what God is doing. It's time to be joyful. It's time to get excited because God has done something. Do you know what God has done here? He has saved us from the pit of hell. He has brought us into his kingdom. He loves us. And it's not just that. He's used us to do amazing things in our community. We had the opportunity to celebrate with a hundred people that have special needs and to celebrate the joy that comes when we love people like Jesus. And it doesn't have to end there. So here's what I want you to do this morning. I want you to get your horns out. And here in just a minute, we're going to worship. We're going to sing a song. Aaron Chambers said something to me in the beginning of this series. You know what he said to me? He said, the closer you get to the heart of Jesus, the more confetti you begin to see. 
So this morning, this morning, I think it's probably a little fitting to see some confetti. What do you guys think? Amen? Let's get excited, church. 